What up, followers? We're ready for another lecture? I'm ready. I got music. I got science all day long. Let's do it. Okay, so today we're going to start getting into molecular structure. And with that, there are two main theories we're going to discuss. That is valence bond theory, VB, valence bond theory. And that's what we're going to do today. All right. Um, and then on the next video lecture, we're going to talk about uh, MO theory, molecular orbital theory. Okay. So a few conceptual points that I'm not going to re uh, write down on the board, but I'll read to you, and, and you should review these in the book and in the notes. Um, so our molecular orbital theory is the modern approach. So this is what we use uh, now. However, it owes some of its origins to uh, valence bond theory, which was actually the first quantum mechanic description of the covalent bond. Um, and that was identified by G.N. Lewis himself at UC Berkeley in 1916, before quantum mechanics was fully established. Um, so pretty cool. Um, and so in uh, talking about valence bond theory, we're going to uh, rely on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which we've discussed already, and that states that it's supposed that nuclei being so much heavier than an electron move relatively slow and may be treated as stationary while electrons orbit in their respective fields. Okay. So our uh, valence bond theory, as I said, it's the first QM description. Uh, so first. QM description of the sigma bond, the pi bond, etc. Okay? Um, and of course, molecular orbital theory also takes advantage of using this uh, sigma bond and pi bond and so on. Um, so let's first talk about uh, H2. And uh, technically, as we'll see, we have to really talk about this as H2 plus we can only really talk about one electron um, but for now let's let's treat it as h2 okay and so i'm going to say psi h2 so the wave function of diatomic hydrogen um, i'll write this as chi h1 s a as a function of r1 so this is my wave function for um, one of the hydrogens, right? Recall H2 is an H bonded to an H, each of them being a 1S. So this is 1SA and this is 1SB. And so recall these two wave functions um, through separation of variables, right, would be multiplied by each other. And I'll call this 1SB as a function of R2. And for simplicity, I'm gonna write this as psi H2 equals uh, A1 times B2. So I'll just say A of 1 is my wave function for electron 1, and B of 2 is my wave function for electron 2. But remember, if we switch signs, right, the special case of Pauli exclusion principle, then we recognize that I could have A2 be one, and remember, if we switch the labels, uh, we have to change sign. Um, so what that means is we can write this as a superposition, okay? So I can say psi H2 equals A1 B2, and that's going to be plus or minus A2 B1, all right? And so if we look at what these two um, uh, effects would be, all right, so I'll draw these out on this side over here. So if this is, let's say, my um, radial plane right here, R, and suppose this is the uh, zero value for R1 and the zero, zero value for R2, okay? So recall, the, I've got some 
stuff hidden over here. So recall the radial distribution for 1s, here it is. Um, n equals 1, L equals 0, right? It looks like this, out to positive values. So at negative values, it'll look like the opposite. So this is the one we're looking at here. Um, so that means it looks something like this, out to positive r's. Uh, it's supposed to be an exponential decay. And then something like this, out to negative r's. So this would be my a. And my b will look something like this. So I'm going to draw it going behind this line. This is what my b looks like. So I'll call that a1, b2. But then, right, if I switch those labels, right, now I'll draw it as, uh, so I've still got B on this side, and now I'll draw the A going behind it, all right? So then this would be A to B1, and now if I look at the, um, the plus state of this case, then what I'm going to get, so if I look at uh, A1, B2 plus A2, B1, and then here again are my two nuclei, then I'm going to get something that looks like this. I'm going to get enhanced electron density in this internuclear region. So I'm going to say that that's uh, enhanced electron density and then I'm also going to specify and we're going to define this axis specifically as the Z axis. Okay, So if I were to take this graph and uh, flip it so that you're looking up at you, um, what you, so if I'm looking now along one of these lines here, so there's my Z axis going into the board and what this circle represents here is my enhanced electron density. So that's cylindrical uh, symmetry about the Z axis. Okay. And so if we were to now look at my, um, well, well, we'll look at the A1, B2 minus states um, in a little bit. Uh, as it turns out, it's what creates uh, what we call the antibond in MO theory, but we're, we're going to get there soon. Okay, let's, we'll focus on the valence bond theory for now. Okay? And so this uh, symmetrical uh, symmetry about the z-axis, uh, we specifically call the sigma bond, single bond with symmetrical symmetry about the z-axis. Okay, um, and so as a, an example, if I were to look at N2, okay, where I recognize now um, each nitrogen atom is going to be a 2s2, and then we know nitrogen, right, is 2s2, 2p3, so specifically that's 2s2, 2px1, 2py1, and 2pz1. So if I have now, um, if I just look at my z-axis once again here, so we'll draw it the same way that we looked at it before, but now this time my p orbital on the z-axis would be oriented in this way, right? So there's one of them, and I would have an electron in that bond. Here's one nitrogen. And then here now I would have my other one, and the electron uh, would be in my other nitrogen right here, okay? So and once again, this is my z-axis going down this plane. When these combine, we make a sigma orbital. And so that's if I were to push these close together here, right, we get something that looks like this. And again, that's a, a sigma bond, even though we made it from two PZs, right, it's still amongst the z-axis. So I can make a sigma bond from a 2s and a 2s. I could also do it, of course, with a 1s and a 1s. And I can do it with 
a 2PZ and a 2PZ, or a 3PZ and a 3PZ, and so forth. Okay, so now let's switch it up a little bit. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to use some spray here. Oh boy, I think I used a wet erase marker. That's all right, because I have a paper towel. Get this all cleaned up here. I have to decide if the fine point wet erase marker is better than the thick pointed dry erase marker. I think considering that this is getting clean, I'll opt for the finer point wet erase marker. Okay, and you guys just get to watch me clean my board periodically here. Beautiful. Okay, so continuing along, let's talk about methane. CH4. Okay, so I've got a carbon and hopefully remember from your mini chemistry classes, methane adopts this tetrahedral arrangement where two of those hydrogens are in the plane of the board and two are coming in and out of the board, okay? And so if we look at the ground electronic configuration of carbon, uh, we know it's 2s2 um, and it will adopt a, a 2px1 uh, and a 2p uh, Z1, all right? And so what? when you think about this now, it says carbon should only form two bonds, right? Because I've got two uh, orbitals with only one electron each. So you would think, well, why, does it, why would it only just take two bonds? Uh, we know really carbon takes four bonds. So we call this promotion and hybridization, hybridization, okay? And so really what that means, carbon, so we think, this is just a theory after all, that it goes 2s1, 2px1, 2py1, 2pz1. So one of my uh, 2s electrons was promoted, and so now um, we have, four unpaired electrons, okay? So this really isn't like uh, an excited state, it's really this notion of, of hybridization, okay? That the orbitals themselves are hybridizing, okay? And so with four unpaired electrons, um, if I were to give it four more unpaired electrons, which I would get one from each of these hydrogens, then I can make my four sigma bonds, my four single bonds. Okay, and note that that z-axis, right, I can shift that z-axis however I want depending on which bond that I'm talking about. So there would be symmetrical symmetry amongst each, uh, cylindrical symmetry amongst each carbon-hydrogen nucleus. Okay, and so if we keep going along with this, so we're going to create from this uh, what we call the hybrid orbitals. And hybrid orbitals are superpositions of atomic orbitals. Okay? Of AOs. All right? And so, um, the way that's going to go, we're going to talk about these in terms of the H1, and I'm noting that this is a vector because it has orientation. The H2, the H3, and the H4. And so this creates uh, my basis set for my superposition of hybrid orbitals. And so the basis set goes as the following. So I can say S1 is going to be, of course, wave function for S orbital plus a wave function for px plus a wave function for py plus a wave function 
for PZ. Okay, so then now I have to go through all of the different uh, combinations in my superposition. So H2 is now S minus PX minus PY plus PZ. H3 is still my S orbital. Now I'm going to uh, still say minus PX. Now I'm going to say plus PY. And then now minus PZ. Okay, so I've switched this PX twice. So now that means on my final case, I'll have this as plus PX. So I've got a plus, minus, plus, and then now minus PY. And I've got plus, plus, and then now minus, minus PZ. Okay, and so now if I combine all of these, so I make a superposition of superpositions, and I say H1, so I make a wave function out of all of this, I make a wave function out of all of this, right? I make a wave function out of all of them. And if I carry through on that basis set, then all of this gives me what I call the SP3 orbital, which is pretty cool. And I'm going to show you a Mathematica simulation of this um, soon. So now, what is the shape of this thing? What does this look like? Well, this requires us to kind of stare at some of our radial distributions. So for now, I'm just going to, I'm going to ignore the angular and I'm just going to look at the radial and so I'll remind you um, so let's see let me uh, move this out of the way here so I'll remind you our 2s orbital um, the radial wave function looks something like this okay and that's symmetric about the uh, z-axis right here so uh, 2s right gives me this equation right here um, oh excuse me sorry 2s here's my 2s Okay, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw this like the following. So I'm going to go back to drawing my z-axis right here, okay. And I'm going to give it one center point, and I think I need to switch colors to make this effective. So now I'm going to draw that radial distribution the best that I can, all right. And so the way that would look, so I'm focused on uh, this one. So we'll say it's something, you know, looks something like this, okay? And so if that's what it looks like out to positive values out here, right, we'll say out to positive values, out to positive R's, and then out to negative values, it's going to be symmetric, okay? So now this one gets a little tricky. If I look at now uh, my two... P, and so my 2P right here is the 2, 1 equation right here. Notice that now it's got that rho right there, which we'll call rho is uh, 2Z uh, divided by Na times R. So now when I go to negative R's, this equation, the sign is going to change. Okay, so if I look here at this 2, 1 state, my 2P, it's going to look something like this. Okay, out on positive values, but then out on negative values, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so now what happens when I add those together? So I get, I'm going to get regions of constructive interference and I'm going to get regions of destructive interference. Of course, that's right over where all my glare is, right? But follow with me here, okay? So in these regions, you can see I'm going to get a lot of destructive interference, okay? So it's going to look, uh, let's see if we can do it here. So it's going to look uh, something like this, okay? Where there's just not going to be a whole lot of density, all right? But now, in my region over here, I'm going to get a lot of 
constructive interference, okay? And so I'm going to see something that looks like this. I'm going to see a lot bigger of a low. And the result of that is the following. So now if I have my s orbital, if I look at it as far as like, you know, down this z-axis, right? Okay, so rotate this 90 degrees. So now there's my s orbital. I should have made that blue. Um, here's my p orbital looking down the z-axis. Okay, so that's sticking up. Uh, and so now when I combine these two things, oh, excuse me, this is not my... Um, Excuse me, this is not 2pz, right? This could be 2px or 2py, right? Because remember, if it was 2pz, um, it would be all in, in this plane. So this has to be either 2px or 2py, okay? Um, and so now I'm going to go ahead and make this video a little bigger. So when I combine these two things, what we get are regions where there's constructive interference and regions where there's destructive interference, okay? And so I have to remember here, right, on this z-axis, I'm going to have a positive and I'm going to have a negative sign here. And so out on my uh, negative values, right, I get some larger amount of constructive interference that I'll represent, like, with this thicker line right here. And on the opposite side, I get a much smaller value because these are all destructively interfered. Um, so what I get is this orbital with this shape, right, that looks like with the big lobe on one side and a small lobe on another side. And for those of you that have, that really like your organic chemistry, that remember your hybridization from OCHEM, you might remember this shape, okay? So let's see, I'm gonna make a little room here. First, I'm gonna have to really clean this thing well since I used a wet erase marker. Okay. Do a little chemistry on my whiteboard while I'm teaching you guys about chemistry. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's just, oops, I still had some marker on my eraser. Okay, so now, moving on, um, we can talk about the sp2 and the sp, which I will in a moment, but what I want to do now is walk you through um, what you're going to be doing in your Mathematica assignment. So I just want to skip to that right away, and to do that here, I'm going to rearrange my windows here, and I'm going to have it so that um, here on one screen, I have the radial wave functions, and on the other screen, I have the spherical harmonic wave functions, um, because as it turns out, um, valence bond theory is really easy to view using uh, Cartesian coordinate scheme as opposed to spherical polar coordinate. Um, so we're going to draft that up, and I'm going to take advantage of having uh, all of these equations here with me. And let's arrange this so you can see the video as big as possible here. Okay, so let's do it. We're going to draft up VB theory in Cartesian coordinate space. Okay? Oh, boy, look at my hands. It's not COVID-19. It's just marker. All right. So the first thing let's talk about, we've been talking about 2S. So let's talk about the psi 2, 0, 0 state, right? We know that's n is 2, l is 0, ml is 0. So that's 2s. And as a function of r, theta, and phi. And so we know that that's going to be the r, 2, 0 of r, and the y, 0, 0 of theta and phi. 
So I have all of those equations right here uh, to make life easier. And so I can call up now my uh, R20 is going to be this equation. And my Y00 is this equation right here. Okay. And I'm going to write these a little bit differently for now. So uh, pay attention to how I'm writing them, all right? So I'm going to say uh, that now my psi 2, 0, 0 of r theta and phi equals, and so I've got now I'm going to have my uh, z over Bohr radius to the 3 halves, so I've got that from right here. I'm going to write the 2 minus rho. And recall, rho is, uh, here it is, way down here, really small, 2z divided by na times r. And because n is 2, the 2 and the 2 cancel. So that's just going to be z times r divided by Bohr radius. And now that's all e raised to the power negative z times r. And look, there's a 2 right there. So I have to say a negative z times r divided by 2 times the Bohr radius. And then now finally, if you look at this here, my y0, 0 is 1 over root 4 pi. And I ignored this 1 over square root of 8. I'm going to combine those and simplify them into one constant, 1 over 4 root 2 pi. So convince yourself that you could get that, that you can convert how I did this um, square root of 1 over 4 pi as well as this 1 over square root of 8. So that should be 1 over 4 root 2 pi. Okay? So now, I want to convert this over into a Cartesian Cartesian coordinate, okay? And so I can write my radius in my Cartesian coordinate space um, in terms of x, y, and z via the following, right? Uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, I also, so then now when I write that down, okay, I can rewrite my psi to 0, 0 as a function of x, y, z. And now that's simply going to become 1 over 4 root 2 pi, z over a to the 3 halves. And then now I'm going to have 2 minus z and then now of course this is going to have to be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared uh yes all divided by the Bohr radius and then now this is painful but right it's going to be e to the power negative z times right x squared plus y squared plus z squared all square root. Uh, and then that's divided by 2 times a. So a lot of stuff in my parentheses. So that's a division. And so this would give me my 2s orbital uh, in xyz space, in Cartesian coordinate space. Okay. So now, what if we wanted to do 2p? And for now, let's focus on uh, 2 pz, right? n is equal to 2, l is equal to 1, ml is equal to 0. That makes it 2pz of r, theta, and phi. Okay, so I know that that's going to be the r21 of r and the y10 of theta and phi. So I've got my handy equations here next to me that I can use and write all that down. Um, and so we're also going to recall, so we know that in Cartesian and uh, converting right back and forth, we know r is x squared plus y squared plus z squared all square root. Also recall that r times cosine of theta 
equals z. So that's going to be really useful. Of course, I wrote that right with a square. That's r cosine theta equals z. There you go. Beautiful. OK. So now when I go to write this r21, OK, let's write all of this out, r theta phi. So let's find r21. So there it is. Okay, and for now, I'm just going to write that as the following. I'm going to say z over a, three halves. And then now you notice that it's times rho. Okay, so that's going to be another factor of z times r over the Bohr radius. Uh, and remember, there's an n, but n is 2, so it goes away. All right. And then now I've still got my e to the negative rho divided by 2. So that's going to be e to the negative z times r divided by 2a. And I left out this normalization constant, this, one, or this, uh, this constant, 1 over root 24 because I want to combine it with my constant for the y10. So you notice on the y10, I've got a cosine theta. So I'm going to write that down. I need that cosine of theta. But then there's also this square root of 3 over 4 pi. But then there was this 1 over root 24. And so if you compare how those are different, they're different by a factor of root 3. So what's pretty cool is this still works out to be 1 over 4 root 2 pi. And now, if you notice here, I've got, look, an r, and I've got a cosine theta, and I've got a z and an a, and a z and an a. So I can now easily switch this over. Psi 210 of x, y, z. And that's going to equal 1 over 4 root 2 pi. Okay, I'm going to combine my ZA and my ZA, and that's Z over A to now the 5 halves. And I've got an R cosine theta. I'm going to call that Z. And then now it's times E. Okay, don't mix this up. We got a couple different Z's. So remember, this big capital Z is charge. Let's put this over there, right? So that's nuclear charge. And by the way, we're going to use a plus 4 in our Mathematica model because that's uh, for carbon. And as it turns out, this, works, this model works really well for carbon. So don't mix up the Zs. This Z is R cosine theta, lowercase z. My Z up here negative z, big z, that's going to be my nuclear charge. In this case, we're going to use plus 4. So now that's going to be negative z times the root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, the coordinate z squared, not the charge, divided by 2a. OK, so that's divided by 2a. And then now, what I can do, I can simplify this even further, and I'm just going to say psi 210 of x, y, z equals z times some function in r, where if I look at how this is all written out, I can see that my function in r is going to be 1 over 4 root 2 pi times z over a to the 5 half times e to the negative z r over 2a, where I remember my r right here is actually x squared plus y squared plus z, plus z squared all square root. Um, and, and my uh, normalization constants are included in that. And so what's pretty cool, I'm not going to uh, derive this, but um, maybe you should go through this for yourself. If I do psi 2, 1, negative 1 of x, y, z, um, I actually get uh, that this is equal to 
y times the same function f of r. And if I say psi 2, 1, positive 1 uh, of x, y, z, I actually get that this is x times some function in r, where all of these functions are now the same. And of course, this is why we call this pz. This is why we call this py. And this is why we call this px. And as it turns out, if we were to do the same process for the d orbitals, this is where we actually get that um, 3dz squared or the x squared minus y squared, right? All of those functional forms actually become the conversion of the polar spherical coordinate space uh, to the Cartesian space, Cartesian space, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to switch over to this um, Mathematica exercise that you're going to work on. So this is Math 8, which remember that's the two-parter. Part 1 is valence bond theory. Part 2 is molecular orbital theory. Um, so keeping all this stuff in mind here, all these equations we drafted up, let's take a look at the next screen. Okay, so here we go. Um, so here's your math tutorial 8. And now um, what I'm going to show you here, so this is going to give you a couple of different options. So to make, um, as this says, to make nice and clean plots, um, I'm giving you some cheater code that admittedly I kind of lifted from the internets myself. So you'll want to copy paste this code in. Actually, I, should, I, don't, I shouldn't say copy paste. I would just type it in because um, some students in past years have had issues just copying and pasting. So you want to enter this code in first, and I'll show you right here's my Mathematica file where I just type that code in. Um, here I'm going to define my radius the same way we define proper functions, right? So radius is a function of x, y, and z, okay? And then now um, I also predefined half of my normalization constant. This is that 1 over 4 root 2 pi because, uh, right, maybe you recognize that 1 over 4 root 2 pi is manifesting every single time. So, and I've said uh, z equals 4 for our charge. And so now when I define psi 2s, look, this is the exact same equation that we drafted up with. And here in this exercise, uh, we're just going to ignore the Bohr radius. We can call the Bohr radius equal to 1. So normally write this with z times r divided by a. We're just going to ignore it for now. Um, that's no big deal. And note, right, every time I put in an r, I've got to say r, x, y, z. All right? And so then I define psi 2px, um, which is now just going to be, right, this normalization constant, now times an additional z to the 5 half. I can define psi 2py. I can define psi 2pz. And admittedly now what I have here, this orbital plot, this is another little bit of cheater code. This is creating a new type of plot in Mathematica. And so in your main tutorial file, right, I give you the, uh, the code for that. There's orbital plot, and there's orbital plot 3D. So, and again, you, you can attempt to copy-paste it, but you might have to just write it all in. And you want to make sure all of these things are coming up in the proper, um, that, that you see they're, they're becoming a different color, because that's how you know that they're being used correctly. But if I walk you through how this orbital plot is going to work, right, first you're going to have your function that describes the orbitals. Then you're going to have some threshold value. And what that threshold value is, uh, it's analogous to when we did the atomic orbital exercise, where we just plotted the atomic orbitals at their uh, expectation value. Um, so, and, and I'm kind of just giving you what these threshold values are because uh, it's kind of tricky to represent uh, four parameters, right, in a three-dimensional equation. And then similarly, there's also this range. So this is like the maximum range of psi. And here specifically, we're, we're not looking at psi squared. We're actually looking at psi because I want you to see where the negative and positive regions actually are. The opacity, that's going to give us like a slightly transparent uh, color, as you'll see in a minute. 
And then color one and color two will give me the colors of the positive region and the negative region, all right? And so now, as just an example here, I'm just showing you orbital plot of just psi 2px and psi 2py. And notice in my notation, right, x, y, I've called z equals zero. So this graph that I have right here is just like a cross section. It's just a slice. Oops, I've cheated now. You can see what the three-dimensional values look like. So here, my... Um, PY, let's say it goes up and down, and my PX goes back and forth. And because I'm plotting Z equals zero, right, I'm just looking at some threshold, and we can see, right, the positive values are green, and the negative values are red. So imagine there being some line right here that describes the X axis, and some line here that describes the Y axis, and the Z axis is coming out of the page at you. And so, for example, just to show you what these different things do, um, so here my opacity is 0.5. If I change that opacity to, uh, let's say, 1, so it's completely non-transparent, you'll see what it looks like. Um, so now, right, those colors got really bright. Um, so if I go to 0.5 again, um, I'm making them like, you know, 50% transparent. Uh, I can change uh, the color here instead of red. If I want uh, blue, for example, I can do that. Okay, so then now when I go to make this for 3D plot, I have to remember I have to use my superpositions. Okay, and so recall for SP3, right? Here it is. We noted my superposition is s plus px plus py plus pz that's just h1 right and then i need s minus px minus py plus pz that's just going to be two of them and my total spz uh or excuse me my total sp3 is going to be a superposition of all of these bases sets so if i go to this mathematical model i'm just going to show you one of these so we have to copy in uh my orbital plot uh 3d model um, which is used very similarly. Now when I go to use my basis set, I have psi sp3 1, all right, and if I look at that, right, that's 2s plus 2px plus 2py plus 2pz, and then here's my h2 and my h3 and my h4, etc. And so now when I go to plot these here, this is my orbital argument right here right okay so that's all four of those equations and i'm plotting them individually and i'm plotting them as they're not as the square modulus just as the wave function so i can see positive and negative regions and uh, this one works really well with a threshold of root 0.6 and a range of 0.2 um, i'm showing you at about 70 percent transparency and once again green and red and what's really cool with this, check this out. When we put all of these together, it actually makes a tetrahedral arrangement. That's awesome, right? That's where this tetrahedral shape comes from. So this is very cool. So, and if we were to measure the angles, if I were to draw like, you know, lines down each one of these, um, then I would see that they are, you know, the 109.5 degrees, the classic tetrahedral arrangement. So I didn't show you what the superposition is for SP3. Um, I've noted that um, in your handout, or excuse me, rather SP2. So here are the bases sets for SP2. Um, and when we put SP2 together, this is what it looks like. So this is awesome. As you recall, we call this uh, trigonal planar. Right, so this would make my trigonal planar uh, geometry. So my nucleus, right, is uh, you know right there in the center, and I can see my 120 degree angles, right. So this, um, if I maybe I just show you what one of these looks like, and you'll be able to tell. Um, so very quickly, let's get rid of those two. Okay, and uh, let's 
get rid of the list argument. Okay, so if I just look at one of these now, uh, right, so there it is going down that line. So you can even see I predict a node. That's a nodal plane between the two positive regions, uh, which it should have. And so now if I bring back my other orbitals, okay, then here you can see I'm going to get my 120 degree angles with respect to each other. And then finally, if I do the basis sets for SP, and you notice the basis set for SP is very simple. It's either S plus PZ or S minus PZ. Um, then I get my really cool linear geometry where once again the nucleus is like you know right there in the center here i'm looking down if i'm looking down my inner nuclear axis right i can see that sigma bond that cylindrical symmetry uh, so this is all very awesome uh all righty folks so this should get you through um uh what you need to know about valence bond theory for the course as well as doing your uh, part one of mathematica eight all right, good luck, folks, and I'll see you on the next video.